my friends call at the gallery when they visit. They're like, oh, I can't wait to come and have dinner at the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm George, co-founder of Blue Thumb, and I'm joined by my colleague Amy. Welcome to the Art in My Home podcast. We uncover the surprising stories behind the art collections of unexpected guests. To the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Today's guest is Nikita Lemesure. Nikita's a startup advisor at Amazon Web Services, a tech investor, and an all-round art enthusiast and collector. I've loved reading about her art collecting journey over the last six years. And I can't wait to dig into how she's put together her collection. Welcome, Nikita. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so, Nikita, could yeah. you tell us about your home? What's the decor, theme, interior, mood feel like of it? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> um, so it's an Edwardian um, uh, single-storey yeah. home. And so it does have some of those original features, which is really nice. Um, but then I'm super obsessed with like modern abstract art. And so it's a great juxtaposition to have these beautiful, colourful piece, uh, pieces against this very traditional um, architecture and style uh, of interiors. So I'd say that's kind of the first hit that you get as you walk in. Um, it's also very colourful. Um, so I think it does bring a lot of joy. It's quite fun, very yeah. lively as you walk in. Um, I'm a little bit eclectic. So <laughs> there are these beautiful like, you know, coloured glass pieces as well. Um, but also cosy. Like, I've got a very comfortable sofa, lots of blankets, um, rugs. And so I think just the mixture is, like, eclectic, a little bit cosy, quite colourful, very interesting and fun. Love yeah. that. Love. Um, what do you kind of hope your guests feel when they enter your space? Oh, gosh. I think when I enter the space, mm. personally, like, I always feel at home. I think the artwork that I've got on the walls. There's a lot of character, like um, portraits and, and personalities that come through these abstract works. They're like kind of characters that you can be friends with. And so you never really feel alone, which is kind of a weird thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very much not alone in my house full of art, uh, which is really nice. Um, I'd say, yeah, that, that sense of uh, the house being cosy and full is definitely something that, that you get, even if you're just there on your own and guests get that as they walk in. My friends call it the gallery when they visit. They're like, oh, right. can't wait to come and have dinner at the gallery. <laughs> 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 Which is kind of nice as well. Like, I think it's just really interesting. There's a lot to look at. Um, while we'll be, you know, uh, drinking around the, the dining table, uh, we'll have a look at the art, we'll have a chat about it. Um, there are a couple of pieces that always throw people off if, if they're there for the first time, which is quite nice. Definitely uh, conversation starters. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say if you walk in, um, immediately you're kind of curious. Um, curious is probably the number one thing. I think a lot of the art being abstract doesn't necessarily tell a very specific story um, that's quite obvious from the get-go. And so people really get to interpret it and read in it what they, uh, what they want. And that's one thing that I love about art. I think the artist has a story to tell, uh, but the viewer also has a story to, to put onto that artwork. And I think there's a really nice dialogue that happens between the artist and, and the viewer, um, between this like, kind of translation piece that is the artwork mm. uh, in you know, perception versus um, you know, what's actually uh, been put down you know, with, with pen, paint, mm -hmm. uh, sculpture in the first place. And um, some of the artworks that you mentioned that kind yeah. of might like sort of, I guess, a curious or, um, you know, ha have, a, have a visceral reaction when you see them. Can you, can you tell us about a couple of them? Oh, there's one yep. um, by a very good friend of mine, Scotty So. Yep. Um, he's a performance artist and, like, I wouldn't say controversial in, in the way that he uh, represents his artwork, but he definitely pushes the boundaries of what is traditional art. Um, I've got a hologram uh, work of his. Um, sorry, I should say I've got a holograph uh, work <laughs> of his. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's actually, it's, it's three different um, uh, pieces in the same uh, holograph box. And uh, one of them, he's uh, dressed up as this Shanghai lady from around the 1930s, and he starts to do a strip tease. And I asked him once about the piece, um, and uh, he said to me uh, that, you know, in, in Hong Kong, uh, there's a red light district, and there are these women who are in the windows, um, but uh, for, for someone who, for example, is homosexual, it's not acceptable uh, over in a place like Hong Kong, which is, you know, now very closely related to, to China. Um, and that's his commentary on, like, you know, what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. But also there's this lady kind of 
inside of the box and, you know, who is she and what does she want and maybe she wants to escape, but also there's, uh, you know, some kind of expression that she has in, like, the dance that she does. Um, and it's really interesting. So many people look at it and they start to see this striptease take place and they become quite uncomfortable. <laughs> it's right next to the dining table. Um, and especially, uh, you know, if, if uh, there's, there's a man that's over and he looks at it and he's like, oh, oh, that woman's, uh, you know, getting naked. And I'm like, oh, no, it's a man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's above board. It's, it's, above it's actually board. the artist's it's man. So it, that kind of, I, I haven't seen it, but that sounds like it reminds me of Blade Runner. Yeah, you know, these are the, it's those holograms that come out. Is yes. It, um, I guess it's a physical powered thing of this rotating striptease that's in your. Yeah, exactly. Room. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I would absolutely love it to be something that's projected from mm. the ceiling, like that comes cool. straight down in the middle of the the dining room, and maybe that's an iteration for Scotty in the future. I mean, a hundred percent, I'd be buying that artwork, procuring it. Uh, but it is. It's in a little box that um, is maybe like half meter by half meter. And it sits on the sideboard at the moment, right next to the dining table. Uh, so it's uh, very much in the in the middle of the um, the open area, which is fantastic. And you can't miss it. And especially if the lights are dimmed and it's quite bright. And it does have three different characters inside of it. And so there's this, you know, Shanghai lady. She's one. Uh, there's Madame Butterfly um, for another. So they're quite, um, you know quite diverse from one another and so it really does keep catching your attention all of a sudden it's changed yeah. and it's you know a completely different story yeah yeah fantastic sounds amazing yeah, really <laughs> i really is. want to see it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on over yeah, yeah. <laughs> um nikita i actually wanted to ask you about the portraiture that you have in your house because i know people find portraiture really divisive quite it's like how do i choose a portrait of an like an old man how do i connect yeah. with that so i wanted to ask you about what portraiture you've chosen in your house Oh, gosh, I actually do have a, a beautiful um, uh, portrait of an elderly man, mm. actually, and it's got a really uh, stunning story behind it. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. It's, um, uh, and nostalgic isn't either. It's, it's, it's a very sad story. I, um, I was at the, the Linden postcard show um, intending to buy a postcard size um, you know, a painting or, or photograph uh, which is very much what the postcard show is about. But they do usually have a couple of other pieces on display. And there was this piece, uh, it was so beautiful, I walked in and immediately I was drawn to it. Um, I was saying before that I have very colourful art. This is kind of the exception to the rule. It's a very dark piece. Um, it's almost all black. It's actually a matte photograph. Um, and then there's this illuminated man uh, standing there side on with a white curtain in front of him and his hands kind of poking through this white curtain. And on his hands, you can see they're shackled. Uh -huh. And actually, they were the shackles that he wore in his prisoner of war camp um, during wow. uh, uh, the Holocaust. And the artist, uh, when she was photographing him, actually interviewed him as well, and he told his story. And she recorded that. And he actually died six weeks later. And it gosh. always, oh my gosh, it always brings a tear to my eye yeah, um, talking about it. But what it's, a, it's story. a beautiful story and yeah. it's a beautiful recording. And for me, that's probably the most precious piece. Mm. Mm. Um, I don't have Jewish, Jewish heritage mm. at all. I have friends who do. Mm. Um, but regardless, that that period in time was uh, you know, so destructive and, and the love that I think we should all have and that I often see depicted in mm. art, like this celebration of life, um, I mean, that for a period of time, like, we, we, we really lost in parts of the world. Um, and then to hear that story, and, and I'm so reminded of it when I see that image, I'm reminded that, you know, you have to make the most of life while you have it, and I like how precious, precious it is. Mm. Yeah. But that's beautiful. That's a stunning piece. So I think there are, there are pieces like that um, that tell these amazing stories that people always ask about, like, what is that? Who is that? Why are they there? Um, do you know that person? Um, and then kind of on the flip side of that, I have these very abstract pieces that are kind of characters and they, they have things that maybe look like eyes. Um, and so you can look at them and, and you kind of wonder, um, is that a character? Is it a person? Like, who are they? What are they? Like, what is it? Um, and I find that really interesting. And they're the characters I kind of like to, to sit with the most and that I think everybody has a different view of. Um, uh, and I, I love asking people what they see in those. They're sure. so different. The answers are <laughs> super diverse. There's this amazing piece. It's probably one of my favourite works um, by Tom Polo, and it's a it's a diptych uh, joined together. Uh, it makes uh, this this character 
Um, and, and Tom has a, a bunch of symbols that he reuses in his work uh, time and time again. Um, and there are these kind of anxieties uh, that are depicted uh, through these characters of like the inner turmoil and, and like this outward expression and a helping hand uh, to, to represent the, the kind of community and the people around you. And I, I love those different layers and elements, um, but you'll get people who don't understand, you know, the context of that artwork come in um, and look at it. And remember there was someone who came in one time and they're like, is that an underwater sea creature? <laughs> and it just, it was so interesting just to see it completely simplified and, and paired back. Um, because at first glance, you know, when, when you look at a piece of artwork, you see one thing, but I think when you sit with it for a while, you start to see something else. And I really do believe that you grow and develop with an artwork. Mm. Um, and I know this has been a super long answer mm. to your question. No, not at all. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> but, but there's, there's uh, kind of a third layer to the portraiture in my house as well. I very recently started a project um, uh, which sounds super narcissistic and I promise you it isn't. <laughs> but I've started to do uh, an annual portrait of myself. Um, wow, okay. And that's uh, kind of a, a project that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm choosing an artist every year who I've fallen deeply in love with um, and who I want to understand and get to know better. Um, and the purpose of it isn't so much to, to get them to, to draw me or to paint me and to, to see this beautiful picture of myself. The point is actually to sit down with them, chat with them, have a few precious hours with that artist, understand their process, build a relationship with them and then see what that actually produces at the end of the day. Um, and in commissioning a work, I've always thought it's incredibly important to, to give the artist um, as much free reign as possible. I mean, you fall in love with them for their IP in the first place, like what they're creating and what they're building. Um, and so for me, I definitely want it to be as representative of, of their work as possible and what they want it to be. Um, but of course, like the one thing I kind of do say to them is like, if you can um, you know, use me as your stimuli, however that is, and it might be a direct representation, it might be some kind of abstract form that it takes, um, that's really what I want out of it. So it's this conversation and this, um, uh, this relationship with me and the artist that I'll see hopefully over time between these works. Um, and every year, the great thing is I get to choose a new artist and um, meet them and, and get to know them better. That's fantastic. Yeah. Do you have like, like a hit list of like artists ready to go that you're like, I want you, I want you. Yes. Can you give me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course I you do. do. <laughs> I have to you on my phone. I'm, I have in notes on yes. my phone this like long list of artists. Mm -hmm. You know where you can get those little dot uh, bullet points yes. that you can yeah. tick on you and they tick become them. a little yep. tick and yep. you can yep. tick them. Um, and so as I buy a piece by an artist, I can tick it off and it's super satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> I love the structure. That's great. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's refreshing. But it's super long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course. Super long list. Yeah. yeah. I've actually had to divide it up. So it's a, like, you know, uh, la large works. I call them large works. But yeah. Really what it means is slightly more expensive works, yeah. not necessarily big in size. Yeah. Um, and then medium and then like more emerging. Yeah. Um, and so I, what I do try and do now, um, I've got a more structured approach to collecting um, and I'll try and do like one, what I call large work a year, um, a couple of kind of, uh, you know, medium uh, career artists, mid-career artists, and then maybe three or four emerging artists work. And that way I can still follow the ones that, you know, I've found uh, from the emerging tier that have kind of moved through um, the art world and grown up a yeah, little bit and, and, you know, gained some recognition, but I might be able to follow them through for a little bit of, of their journey as well. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing to be able to collect an artist's work over time. I mean, there'll always be a point where that drops off, it becomes too expensive uh, or something, but... Um, uh, it's, I think it's a beautiful thing to see their work evolve um, mm. and to, to be a part of that journey with them, yeah. And I guess some would change tears as well in your phone. Yeah, <laughs> like they were the small and now they're like the large and like, damn it. Or if you bought them when they were small, you're like, yeah, great. Yeah, right. <laughs> Although that's what I don't know if I could ever sell any of the works in my private personal collection. Mm -hmm. I really do fall in love with them. Um, but I do have uh, a friend that I've started collecting with and our goal is actually to... Uh, to buy in order to sell over time sure. uh, and to, to be a part of the market, mm -hmm. um, which I also think is really important. I think uh, people often look at, at the art market and, and collectors who think of art as an investment as maybe a bad thing. I actually think it's a really good thing. The more money we can bring into the space, um, the larger the market is, which means more uh, emerging artists can actually enter the space as well. We see it with the startup system. Uh, startup ecosystem, which obviously is where I work. Mm. Um, and the more capital that comes in, uh, the more startups uh, that can emerge, the greater the innovation as well. And so I think that will actually allow us in a flywheel kind of way to see more interesting art emerge. And so I'm very happy to, to approach art collecting in that manner as well. 
Yeah, yeah I love that. Yeah. I, love, I love that way of framing it. And I really, I want to get into, uh, you know, I want to get into the details of that syndicate. But I did have a question yeah. when you were talking about um, the abstracts in your house, like the, uh, Tom Polo, I think you yes. said. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I've, I've never thought to do this, but it's kind of like a Rorschach test, isn't it? To ask a guest, what is this, what, what's this what about? What do you see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next time really you come over, George, I'll ask how you. How people such think, a, your guest think. Such a shame it wasn't before this, and then I could have asked you live on air. <laughs> I'd probably see an underwater squid with you, my guess. <laughs> underwater sea creature. Under- <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. Um, I guess maybe we'll um, have a chat about how you got into art mm. collecting, Nikita. Like what initially drew you into collecting to start with? Oh, wow. Uh, gosh, that takes me all the way back to, to when I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like a very, very tiny child. So my mother's always been really into the arts. She's mm-hmm. loved the arts. Mm-hmm. My parents didn't collect. I think they would have actually loved to, but there was so much to do um, when you know we were all younger. Um, but one thing that uh, our parents did, so I'm a twin, uh, with with um, my twin brother, Rupert. Um, and growing up, our parents really cared that we both were exposed to sports and art. And so uh, every month, my mother would take one of us to the ballet and my father would take one of us to the football. And then we'd swap. So Rupert, my twin brother, he'd go to the ballet and I'd go with my dad to the football. Um, and I think that was actually a really great thing for us growing up. We were really exposed to kind of all areas of, um, you know, uh, uh, activity um, and creativity as well. Uh, but what it really did was it took away, like, the, the gender role associated with either being maybe creative or sporty, and, and both of us always grew up playing sport and engaging in art. Like, Rupert's got a lot of artist friends. In fact, he probably knows um, more artists socially um, than I do, and I've kind of got to know mine through collecting, um, through, like, this kind of more structured avenue, um, but he's actually kind of, you know, over on the north side, uh, basically living next door to artists, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, and so that's really how I got into it. And my mum would always take us to galleries growing up as well. So every time there was a new exhibition on at the NGV or the Ian Potter Centre um, or a local gallery, we'd go along and we'd have a look at it and we'd talk about what it might mean. Um, and we also did a lot of speech and drama, which I know is another you know, art form. Um, it's a different kind of creativity, but I think definitely lends to um, having open-minded kind of neuropathway structures in mm. the brain. And uh, she was... Uh, a huge believer in exposing us to really interesting, you know, poetry and, and theatre. Um, and uh, she had a, a group of young children our age that she'd have over to the house and she'd teach them poetry. Um, and so we'd all be there together learning and reciting poetry and understanding what it meant. And that was, I think, uh, probably, uh, again, another kind of genesis for, uh, for this love of creativity that I have. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Sounds like the Tenenbaums almost, the artistic yeah. Tenenbaums. <laughs> did, you, did you do art as a kid? I did. I did yeah. a lot of art. I yeah. wanted to be a fashion designer growing up. Oh, cool. And so I drew dresses all the time. I yeah. had books and books and books of beautiful dresses. I'd name them really weird names. Like I came across one the other day and I'd, I'd um, put my age down and what year I was in and the date. Um, I was very... Um, uh, you know, documentation-y kind of about it. Yeah. I think I thought I'd become something special and they'd be very special one day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's never happened. It's started not a fashion on, the, on the autobiography early. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> Thinking big from a young yeah. age. <laughs> Fantastic. And I came across the name of this dress which had this, like, huge bubble skirt kind of in the colour of an apple and it was called the apple tea dress. <laughs> iconic. I thought it was, uh, yeah, iconic. Mm-hmm. Um, very creative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually do have one of my own works in the house as well. So a finger painting that I did as a child, which I came across when I was putting all the artwork up um, and unpacking all my boxes when I moved into my new place. And the colours perfectly match the colours of a Rico Rennie I have on the wall. And so I put them both in the same space. And they're such a juxtaposition. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a change from one to the other. I mean, one's super large scale, the other one's really tiny. Um, and uh, it's it's actually really beautiful to see them side by side. We walk into the room and I always say to people, you know, which one's your favourite? Be really mindful how you answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> why, why did you stop? Mm. I never really stopped. Mm. I still doodle. I mm. do a lot of doodling. Um, I never really pursued being an artist. Mm. I actually studied performance art when I was at university, so I... I explored being more of a theatrical practitioner um, in in the sense of an artist and I looked a lot at producing. Um, I did some of my own photography 
I worked in luxury fashion for a long time as well, looking at how luxury brands uh, perform who they are through, you know, repeat advertising, but also through the runway, which I found really fascinating, um, but also looking at how we perform who we are through what we wear. And um, I, found, I found that relationship that I have to fashion uh, kind of my way of, of keeping creativity even after I moved into tech, uh, which for me is still a very creative space. Mm. Like every day I'm working with startup founders and I find that they're just as creative as artists. Like really what they're doing is they're seeing a problem and they're going, wow, I can think of a brand new way to solve this and to change it for the world. Um, and they, they pull it apart and they kind of re-engineer it in the same way that an artist will see something it'll inspire them and they'll kind of pull that memory apart or pull apart what they've seen and, and they re-engineer it um, through their artwork in a different way and, and maybe kind of fuse it together with some emotional experience that they've had. Um, but out the other side comes something that's, you know, unknown and new and, and, and fresh to, to everybody else's eyes. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, but I also think there are really strong parallels with startup founders um, to, to artists. So I feel like I haven't really moved away from it. And so kind of helping founders and advising founders. In a way, I'm not necessarily an artist. Maybe I'm like an art teacher. <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> Maybe yes, you could think of it that yeah. way. I don't know if I'd go that far, actually. But, <laughs> but I think there's, there's some kind of symbiosis. So I'm yeah. still using the creative side of my brain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I love, yes. I love that way yeah. of thinking about kind of technology as well. Because, yeah, I've, I have similar thoughts. You sort of, you're, I feel like you're building something yeah. new from nothing, and even though it's on the internet. But. Completely agree. Um, and so at, at Amazon, so you work at Amazon at the moment with startups. Are there, are there any kind of art startups specifically that, that you're working with or have worked with? At the moment, I don't specifically work with any art startups yeah. um, myself. I work with just a couple of scaling startups at right. the moment. Um, but there are some incredible ones that I've come across. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm personally an investor in a business called Art Money, yes. um, who I've never looked after at, at AWS, so no conflict of interest. <laughs> um, but, but they're an amazing way to buy now, pay later for art, which actually makes art a lot more accessible. And I'm a huge believer in, in making art as accessible as possible. I think everyone should be able to experience, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty and, and the, you know, visceral uh, change that you emotionally uh, get when you see an incredible piece of artwork. Um, something that just moves you. Um, I think everyone should have that right. And so, uh, you know, uh, platforms that can democratise that, I'm a very big fan of, for sure. Um, and then there are some really innovative um, uh, solutions out there at the moment in, for example, the blockchain space. I know NFTs are, are something that are somewhat controversial in this space, and I think that's because at the moment uh, NFTs represent just these kind of meme works, which isn't at all what an NFT is. An NFT is actually a token that can track, um, uh, that can be tracked uh, across a, a ledger, a digital ledger. And the point being that if you can track, uh, for example, an artwork across that space um, and tie a contract to it, every time it changes hands, the artist can get a royalty. And there's something actually really um, amazing about that and game changing. Like at the moment, the industry doesn't operate that way. Mm -hmm. You buy and you on sell an artwork uh, in the secondary market and there's no kickback for the artists themselves. But this digital mechanism, these NFTs actually enable that. And I think they're actually really exciting for that reason. Um, so uh, for example, Seminal One is an Australian startup. And what they're actually doing is uh, they're providing a marketplace uh, blockchain or NFT environment where uh, Art that, for example, I buy, um, I could maybe list on the Seminole One site um, and I own the IP, but also the artist uh, also has some rights. And so uh, I could, for example, put up um, a artwork uh, by an Australian artist, let's say, I don't know, Sydney Nolan or something, and, and maybe um, Vegemite wants to use uh, that image on a jar in the future. Um, and they could purchase the, the right to that image for, for that advertising purpose. Um, and then the, uh, the NFT um, could then kick off kind of a royalty to the artist and, and I could get a percentage of, of that as well. And so it, it kind of monetizes art commercially um, in a way that actually benefits the artist as well. And I think there's something really interesting in, in the future for that. Um, that's, that's definitely got uh, a really strong uh, commercial um, idea around it mm -hmm. that we don't really see a lot in, in the art space. Yeah. And then there's another, uh, there's another startup that I heard of over in, I think it came out of Stanford University. And it sounds incredible. They use artificial intelligence um, to monitor changes in an artwork. So to be able to figure out if it needs to be um, 
uh, if they need an arch archivist to come and, and fix the work or adjust it. Mm. Um, so if you're just constantly taking photos in a gallery or over a period of time, um, it can advise an archivist to, to, um, to note deterioration in the artwork, for example. Oh. But equally, if it's been moved between galleries for exhibitions um, and there's been like a, a dramatic heist, um, yeah. the, the AI should be able to tell if the artwork is a fake as well, wow. which I think is really interesting. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Actually, that it would be fascinating to put all of the kind of known works from, you know, known, known artists yeah. and work out, you know, ask... AI if, um, if any are fake or if, yes, you know. Yes, if they don't match the style yeah, of the artist. They're, yeah, yeah, they're, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, cool. I, um, I, oh, thank you, Connor. Oh. <laughs> we'll make it. On the next yeah. round of cocktails. Yeah. How's I'm, the I'm timing, Connor? No, 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 Talk was, less drink more. That's yeah. my I'm life so, motto. I'm so tempted to go really deep on <laughs> generally <laughs> bad. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry about it Thank at all. So I feel like my answers please. are really long and winded. No, I'm just like I'm a bit of a chatterbox. No, no it's like, actually so do a lot fascinating. Of there's you know? like, no, no, there's like eight, eight <laughs> follow ups I want to ask. Oh, there's so many, so many things we need to ask. Yeah, no, absolutely fascinating. So continue, like keep going. Awesome. Yeah, I. How do you feel about um, AI art and generative art? You know, it's obvious, it's so new. But sort of, what what do you how, do? You have any thoughts about it and what might happen in the future? And a sort of, is this exciting or you know, what are your thoughts? I'm actually super excited by yeah. AI in the art world for a number of reasons. I think from a um, you know art peripheral standpoint, you could look at how AI might be able to automate the insurance process based on how popular the, the artwork is becoming, how the prices are driving up, valuations are changing, um, the, the artificial intelligence solution uh, or machine learning solution should be able to say to you, oh, this is the new premium that you should be paying for this artwork and we'll adjust, uh, you know, the, the outset. Um, but equally, uh, valuation tooling, I think there's, there's a huge um, business side to AI in the art world that I mm. think would be really interesting. Um, equally around kind of advisor algorithms, like if you think of it in the sense of at the moment we have uh, these art advisors whose curatorial capability is, you know, uh, what makes them, you know, incredibly special. We see Gen AI starting to produce really interesting creative works at the moment. Um, and I don't see why generative AI can't also kind of curate your next collection um, and curate the works that you should be buying and, and build a list for you based on what they know you like and what your risk tolerance looks like and what people who are similar to you have been purchasing uh, based on your, uh, you know, uh, the, the works that you've previously purchased and the changes in prices of those. Maybe the, the AI can suggest you into a new kind of pricing, you know, a, a purchasing band um, as well. So I think there's something interesting there. But then, sorry, coming back to your question about mm. the actual artwork itself, there is definitely a place for it. Some of the most sophisticated art coming out at the moment, like you look at Refik Anadol, who does those beautiful kind of undulating um, uh, data uh, colour works, and, and I'd love to see where he takes that in the future. Um, they're so stunning and they're, they're really mesmerising and I think people can get lost in that and it's like a little dream world. Um, and I think your mind just wanders and starts to imagine. And I think there's a, a really interesting kind of... Um, uh, uh, kind of kicker that that artwork has, and that's definitely not the word I was looking for, but <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some kind of reaction that you mm -hmm. have when, when you see that. You start to imagine, and it's, it's a um, yeah, catalyst uh, for the imagination, which I think mm -hmm. is so beautiful and, and so needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we live in such a, a, not a black and white world, but um, a world where we're moving so fast. Anything that's a catalyst for your imagination, I think, is very special. Um, and and Refik's work, I think, is, is very much that. Um, and so... You know, he's, he's one of many. There are so many artists starting to use these, uh, you know, algorithms to, to drive new works and creativity. And I'd love to see, um, you know, in the film space and, and kind of the art media uh, space, for example, holograms as well, um, but, but mixed media, what that might look like in the future. I think we'll see some really interesting multidimensional works mm. coming out of the AI world that maybe would have been too difficult to do uh, without AI. Mm. 
Yeah. That undulating work you're referring to, is that the one that was at the NGV, mm. that big, like... Yeah, that, yeah. 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 Oh, I've got yeah. a couple of his, his so NFTs, cool. Oh, my God, did you really? Oh, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> On a wallet Sold somewhere. Wow. <laughs> sure. I'm a little bit jealous. <laughs> I love him. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, I'd say he's uh, in in my you know top five favorite artists of all time. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was incredible yeah. to stand in front of. Yeah, that, that, yeah. The, the big scale ones. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's God. gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Gosh. Agree. Um, okay. I don't. No, I think you've already said you don't have a specific focus or preference for you like what you're adding to your collection. So, is there any kind of favourite kind of medium that draws you in when you're adding to your collection and, like, or what you want to pop in your home kind of thing? Is any like, like, I love a chunky abstract is what I call them when they're really <laughs> thick and yeah. heavy and painterly. But, yeah, do you have anything in particular that kind of be like, you got me? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say I guess if you, if you zoomed out, like, maybe more 30,000-foot view, um, the theme, like, the thematic kind of, build of my collection is is very much around um like abstract emerging australian artist mm. works mm. that would be the the broadest mm-hmm. cross section of the works in my home obviously there are there are outliers like everywhere on every angle uh, but that would probably be the yeah the the bulk of the collection could fit that umbrella and so i think i am very drawn to particularly abstract painting um by emerging artists who are who have found or maybe just found their voice and and you can tell because the style is very reminiscent um, of of who they are over a couple of collections. Um, And I think that draws me in because there's there's something about finding your voice as an artist. Mm. Um, The work becomes very strong um, and it does definitely uh, become quite magnetic. Uh, And so I'd say abstract emerging artists, kind of as they're finding their voice at that kind of point in time, my head turns, Mm. yeah. I find like with with artists with like a, a big body of work, like emerging artists when, when yeah. they have, um, you know, I'm, think, I'm thinking fairly specifically on, on Blue Thumb, but, you know, say there's like a hundred works up there, there's always about one or two that I desperately love and I want and the rest are good but they sort of don't speak to me. Do, do you feel the same way when you're collecting? Are you sort of more about the, you know, this is the next artist I want to collect and or is it really I want this particular work? from this artist and that's, you know, that's the one I'm chasing. I'll buy it on secondary, whatever, that's the one I need. How, how do you approach that? I reckon I do both. Okay. Um, so I'll fall in love with an artist's work. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll see their work time and time again and, and the body of work I might fall in love with, but equally sometimes there's just one, one piece. Yeah. Like, for example, Tracy Moffat's Something More is a series that I would go to the ends of the earth to try and collect if I could. Um, at the moment, I feel like it's probably out of my price range, but oh gosh, like I would, I would take it instead of an engagement ring, you know, like mm. that's how strongly I feel mm. about the artwork. I think it's, it's beautiful and it's amazing. And I, I actually do have a, um, a, an automated tracker on it every time, <laughs> every time the artwork comes up in auction, I get an email saying it's available. Oh, is that and like, like a, a Google me. alert or something? That's amazing. Google yeah. alert, oh, wow. exactly. Okay. On, wow. on mutual art, you can set, um, yeah. you can set alerts. It's, it's quite cool. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So, so sometimes it is a mm. specific, mm. um, artwork that's just spoken to you. Um, but for the most part, like I'll really fall in love with an artist's work. I won't collect anything by the artist. Like I have to really love it. I think there are so many works that are out there that are so incredible and so many artists that are so incredible that you don't have to ever buy a work that you're not in love with, that doesn't speak to you, that doesn't have something visceral for you. Um, And so I think I still would wait for the right work with the the artist to come up, Um, but I would really try and get to know them and build a relationship. And sometimes that relationship does change how you feel about a work. So initially it might not be your favourite piece, mm. but then you learn a little bit about it from the artist mm. and what it meant to them and why they painted it or why they, they sculpted it. And you, um, you take away something from that that feels a little bit, uh, you know, it makes you a bit closer to the artwork. Um, and then, you know, you can't stop thinking about it. And sometimes those works that you really hate are the ones that you're the most passionate about. <laughs> and mm. they stick with you. Mm. They really stick in your mind. 100%. And then eventually they're the ones that you want in your home yeah. because they'll always make you think. They'll make you react. It's like and a I think splinter. Yeah. Like yeah. You sort of, 
Yeah, I exactly. feel exactly the same. And I feel that way about music too. Often yeah. the, the songs I've, I've discovered that I have viscerally hated yeah. are now my favourite songs. It's because they challenge you, I yeah. think. Exactly. At, at first. I think that's why Rachmaninoff became so, so popular back in his day, you know, classical music era. But he was so different and mm. so disturbing, you couldn't not listen, mm. you know, couldn't not be part of it. It's like a car yeah. crash. Exactly. Just keep going, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that you eventually <laughs> fall in love with. Yeah. Slightly <laughs> less desirable. <but> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, so you sort of just said then that you often will talk to artists about their work and that kind of gives you an insight and, you, you know, helps you work out what you love, you know, from, from, from them to buy. How do you actually, how do you approach artists? Where do you talk to them? Like, do you go to their studios or fairs? Like, you know, where, where, are, you, where are you meeting artists? Um, I wouldn't meet them at a studio, but mm. I do definitely go to their studios once I get to know them. Um, I probably meet them at gallery openings most of the time. So the gallerists, I think, play this really important role in, in being the conduit between the collector and the artist. Um, and I've met almost every artist that I've met uh, at a gallery or at an art fair and obviously the, the gallerists have brought them along as they're showcasing their works. Um, and so I think it's really important to get to know the gallerists really well because then they understand your style, how you collect, what's important to you and they're the ones who will message you when there's a new artist that's on the scene that, that they're trying to showcase that they think really aligns with your values, who you are, what your collection looks like, um, you know, what, what you're really about uh, as an art collector. Um, and that's when you can meet these, these really inspiring uh, people or artists um, who, you know, you may have never come across in, in another world. Um, and I think that's really exciting. Um, I have met through some other artists, artists as well. And I think there's, you know, a little bit like just meeting friends through friends. Um, you know, once, once you, uh, you know, build a relationship with an artist, you know, there's typically some kind of emotional, um, emotional relationship there. And they'll have uh, an emotional relationship with someone else. And a little bit like when you've got a friend of a friend, usually you just really like that person because there's like a similarity mm. between those two people, like they're friends for a reason and you're friends for a reason. And so I find it's often the same with artists if they introduce you to another artist's friend. Like there's, there's still this like through line of action. There's something that you'll probably really like in their work too because there's a connection between both of them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, if, they, if yeah. they're sort of, if they like the work, you probably will end up... Like, yeah, you know, liking assume. them too. Yeah. yeah. And I really yeah, like cool. that tip about, um, you know, meeting artists at fairs and gallery yeah. openings because I organise a lot of the art fairs that we do and we always encourage the artists to come on the booth, to come yeah. meet buyers because buyers love meeting artists. They want to understand the story behind, like, the paintings and they want to have a chat about how you started and things like that. So I think that's a really great tip for artists listening. Yeah, to come to fairs. Well, but also Instagram. It's yeah. a great yes. way to find artists. Absolutely. Like, say you're looking on Blue. Yeah. Fun, and you come across a couple of artists, then go onto their Instagram page, get to know really what they're about in mm. greater detail. You could message them, have a conversation, build a relationship, build a rapport. Um, there's, there's, um, yeah, technology is amazing um, yes. for, for changing how we engage with artists. They've stopped, um, you know, being something that, uh, you know, a, an advisor has put on your wall and, and, you know, you have an idea of who that artist is to someone that you feel you could know mm. um, through, through social media and then get to know and I, I think that's a real window of opportunity for, for any budding or young collector who's really wanting to get into the space and understand it and, and get to know artists and feel inspired. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. We, um, we invested nine months building a, a chat feature. So, you know, as, <gasps> as a collector, you can talk directly to an artist. It was like a really big thing to build, you know, like, should we do this? There's so much time. But, yeah, we just thought it would be important. Yeah. And, yes, yeah, it, it has been. It's been great. And, yeah. I think that is really important. Yeah, I just, think that's an amazing feature. Yeah, you yeah. can kind of, yeah, you can really understand and, yeah, we love, understand like, the process. But even it's lovely to see, like I know it's a bit stalkerish, but it's lovely to see the communication as well, like artists or like buyers will message and be like, I brought you a painting, I hung it up, it's beautiful and I just wanted to let you know. And artists are like so chuffed about that. So it's yeah. lovely to have that open dialogue with them. Yeah, it's like, really edifying. Let them edifying. connect, otherwise yeah. you kind of, yeah, it's just you're buying and you're receiving, but then it's like, oh, so you can go message them, so... Well, Very I think good. it's it's an emotional experience. Absolutely. And so having the human in there mm -hmm. um, as as part of the the con, you know the artist being the conduit to totally. to the sale. I mean, for want of a better word, but um, it's it's an emotional experience mm. procuring an artwork, and and the artist is the best person to take the collector on that emotional experience or that emotional journey. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I think that's very special. I mean, that for me would be you know 
the number one draw card. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I often um, will, uh, after I've met an artist, like they go straight to the top of my list. <laughs> you got me. I've had, had, had a great chat with them, you know. Apple, Apple <laughs> Notes the gets reordered. Yeah. 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 The list is long. Oh, the list is okay. long. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, 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 we know what. You're yeah. at the studio in the corner, like. Yeah. Up, up. I'm like, please, no one meet me. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot. I have too many favourites. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love the organisation. It's great. Yeah. It's refreshing yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've obviously, you know, been into the arts your whole life and yeah. very much very kind of immersed in it. How did you actually start collecting art? So when I left London, I left my performance art world behind And I'd lived with fashion designers and models and just really interesting creative people in uh, the, um, you know, in my London world. And I'd been studying performance art and working in in fashion. But when I came back to Australia, I was working in cybersecurity, which you might think is like the total opposite end of the spectrum. It was an AI business, so very creative as well. Mm. But at the same time, I was very far removed from the art world and the art scene. Um, having come back to Australia and not really having that network around me anymore. So I started to go into commercial galleries um, just as a way to connect with with that world that I miss so much. I'd just go in and I'd look around. And one day I was in a gallery and the gallerist approached me and was like, oh, you know, what have you come in for? And tell me a little bit about yourself. And I I told her about my background um, and that I'd literally just started my very first job and that I you know, absolutely loved art and, and was hoping to try and meet some, you know, artist friends uh, back in Melbourne uh, to, to compensate for missing so many of them back in London. And she was like, come to our next opening, come to our next exhibition, and introduced me around to the artists and remembered my name and really invited me into the fold. And I think that was a really important part of my collecting journey. Um, that really made me comfortable because I think... Coming into the art world, it can feel like there are barriers to entry and I think online galleries like Blue Thumb really help to tear those down Um, and then obviously pricing solutions like Art Money do as well. Um, But having an inviting environment where you feel welcomed in and people speak to you, that is like the the next level. Mm. You need to be invited in because looking from the outside, it can feel scary and pretentious. And I never felt that. I did very much feel a part of the art world, having grown up with it in London. Um, So I I never was uncomfortable, um, but it did make me realise, like, how warm the industry in Australia is. Like, it's a very accessible industry. Um, You go into a gallery and the gallerists are so excited to see a young collector in there. They want to know what brought you in, what you're interested in, Even if you're not available to to buy a work, they're so happy to take you around and show you. Um, It's just the the matter of feeling comfortable enough to walk through the door, I think, sometimes. Yeah, so anyone out there that's listening, walk through the door, the Mm. next gallery that excites you as you walk past it, because I promise you, like, learning about the artwork will be so worth it. Yeah. Yeah, they're not all scary. They're not all scary. They're not. (laughs) They're really not. We had that exact experience last week. We were up in Sydney and we walked into a few galleries and... Yeah, I was overwhelmed by how nice everyone was. Shout out to Nanda Hobbs. They were like, get in here. We're like, okay. We spent six hours in a podcasting room. We did not look like... We were not lying, but we were like, oh, we like this. Yeah, Yeah, I reckon I walked up the street, you know, in my runners and probably probably a tracksuit. I was probably on a walk or something in like active wear leggings. Yeah. 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 We just want to chat to people, really. We're sitting at our desks. When people come in, you just want to have a chat, you know. Exactly. It's so nice. Yeah. So... Uh, no, no, no. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> dive in. I wanted to ask about, do you have a system for keeping track of your collecting, like, or how you keep track of all your artworks? I don't know if it's embarrassing, but yes, I do. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not at all. I um, I actually have, I think it's a semi-sophisticated system. I haven't seen many other people's, so I don't know, like, how mine compares. But I have a spreadsheet with, I think, about um, at 20 different uh, columns um, for different data points for each artwork that I collect. So I track everything from uh, the the palette. So is it bright? Is it like dark and moody? Is it kind of pastel? All the way through to is the artist an Indigenous artist or not? Are they male or female? What's their gender? Um, You know, what's their uh, country of origin? So I track kind of all these different things as well as who else has collected the artwork. So has the artwork itself been collected by a a minor gallery, a major gallery, a known collector? 
Has the artist been collected by any of those? Um, and not all of them I'm surfacing insights from at the moment, but my hope is that over time I'll be able to kind of track, um, you know, firstly for, for my sake, the mix within the collection. Like I, I think it's really important to have a mix of uh, genders um, in the collection uh, that's, that's fairly even. Um, I really want to make sure there's a strong portion of Indigenous artists. As, as an Australian, I think that's really uh, key to who we are, to have this, um, uh, this uh, link to where we've come from. Um, and I think that story is really well represented uh, by Indigenous artists, so it's very important to me to have um, a, a good representation of works uh, by Indigenous artists in the collection. Um, but equally across colour palettes, I'm curious to see, over my collecting journey, do I go from bright colours to something more moody? Like, does my taste change? Does it become, quote, unquote, like, more sophisticated? Um, what's the mix of, you know, paintings to sculpture? Um, are they large works or small works? Like, do I, do I move to, um, you know, uh, textiles over time? I'm really curious to see how time changes the collection as well. Um, but then I also track prices, and I'm very interested to see if, if prices change based on what kind of um, collection the artist might have gone into or the particular work might have gone into, or, for example, if they've been nominated for a, an Archibald Prize. Um, I just think that data is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and as someone who works in tech and works with data every day, um, that's just like a little personal project. I don't know how I will be making decisions based off that, but I kind of feel like my hope with some of... Uh, those insights more around um, how how the artist's journey uh, moves. I think that might inform in the future my syndicate collecting, um, less so my personal collecting, which will be very much driven by do I love the artwork. Um, but I do have a very conscious uh, effort and focus on the um, yeah the the breadth of work in the collection. So around say genders and um, and yeah origins of of artists and styles. Mm. Yeah, strong focus there. Fantastic. That, that kind of, um, especially with your syndicate, that kind of like provenance tracking essentially yeah. um, would be super handy because it's like you're, especially when you're purchasing pieces, you can actually track, well, you already know it's come from you or like when you're purchasing a Sydney Nolan, you yeah. can be like, this is where it's been. So, yeah, really interesting. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, are, th are there, is this artist maybe at an inflection point in their mm. career. Like, is this the time to be collecting them? Mm. Uh, have they really found their voice and are they about to kind of take off and, and can I be a part of that journey with them? Um, I think that's really interesting from, uh, from that, um, you know, market perspective uh, that we were talking about before. Mm. Um, so finding those, yeah, inflection points um, and trying to understand how the market really operates. Because it's, it's quite a closed market. Like, a lot of the data yeah. isn't accessible. Um, and so I think... As an insider with tacit knowledge, you have an opportunity to understand the market in a way that maybe other people don't. And I'd like to you know, be able to um, uh, you know, be a part of sharing some of those insights with other people mm -hmm. and, and also helping to, to grow the, uh, the industry through that knowledge as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super interesting. I, um, I'd love to see that spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to build Bloomberg for us. I'd love to see what it's like in 20, 20 years and, yeah. like, whether any of this has become useful. <laughs> no. So you could, you could probably put it into GPT now and ask yeah. for some insights. It might be oh, interesting Oh, what a great exercise. idea. There we go. That's how AI is going to be transforming yeah, the go. industry. Just, Done. Yeah, yeah, like, GPT, that's, that's tell me about my business, collection. George. Yeah. <laughs> Want to start it together? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. You sound like the organised one, I so see sure. some ideas <laughs> pop in here, guys. Dreaming, dreaming. <laughs> Um, you mentioned your syndicate. Can you can yeah. you tell me about that? Like, what wh what is it, and and what are you guys doing? So I've started one on a small scale mm. where I collect with a good friend of mine. Um, so I wanted to learn a little bit more about venture capital, and he's in that space. And I've been collecting art for about eight years, and he really wanted to learn more about art. And so we decided that we would join forces. Um, we created a small trust together, um, and in that, he will uh, kind of teach me about making decisions on investments into startups or funds, and I teach him on, uh, you know, looking at art um, and thinking about art in terms of its market opportunity. Um, and together uh, we bring, you know, our own skill sets, we talk about them, we get an unbiased opinion from the other person, and, and we make decisions on, on what goes into that trust. And so that was kind of my first foray into it, um, and it's been really exciting and super fun. Um, and then the, the next iteration is uh, that 
I'm building a group of about 10 to 15 people um, who together are going to buy artwork. And over a period of time, we will own that work together. Everyone will put in, say, $5,000 a year. Um, and uh, what you get to do is uh, rotate that artwork around your home. So you get a beautiful, really exciting piece of artwork by probably a mid-career artist, which you probably wouldn't be able to afford on your own, in your house for like a year. Um, and then you'll get another one the next year and another one the next year. And it'll rotate between uh, the, the people in the syndicate. And eventually we'll reach a point, say 15 years down the track, uh, where we will decide to um, either auction off that piece to someone within the group. So we'll have it value, uh, valued, auction it off, um, or uh, then take it to auction if, if no one in the group actually wants to purchase it or is able to purchase it. Um, and then potentially, um, you know, maybe we'll make some money, but we've all enjoyed uh, the process. Uh, part of it is that every quarter we'll go to different galleries, sit down with them and an artist and learn a little bit about that artist's practice. So there'll be an education piece to it and a community piece where we're all going to be learning together, buying together, um, building our knowledge and our understanding and our love of art together. And I think there's something so exciting in, in That's that. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That's yeah. really cool. And, yeah, like a, a, a group, you know, that, that many people looking and kind of suggesting mm. surely can only give you like an excellent funnel for the next piece, right? Mm. Exactly. You know? That's what you hope. You, know, yeah. you hope that you'll get a really diverse um, set of pieces through different people's eyes as well. Um, and, I mean, my goal would be that we'd do um, every year an artwork by kind of a mid-career artist, um, but then also, you know, like a wild card, like an artwork by an emerging artist that we've all kind of fallen in love with mm. and we've really gotten to know and understand. And maybe as well as the group gets closer, we could go and do art trips up to Sydney, um, into the Northern Territory, uh, to, to, you know, Mona, for example, in, in Tasmania and... Uh, really explore uh, the Australian art scene together, yeah. which I think would be really exciting to do. Does it have a name yet, the syndicate? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to meet. I'm, I actually was supposed to organise that in January. And I yeah. <laughs> January's a writer, don't worry. <laughs> January's always a writer. It's so true. But, but the goal is to get it started and kicked off in Q1 this year. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, that sounds bloody exciting. Mm. All right, we've got an exciting question for you, Nikita. Dive is there in. a piece that you let get away? Is there a piece that I let get away? There are so many pieces that I've fallen in love with that have already been purchased. And on occasion, I feel like there's one that I've been umming and ahhing about and maybe wasn't financially able to buy and then it's kind of gone. Sure. Um, but I think the concept of, of got away I'm going to say no to mm. only because I think even if you've missed an artwork, the artist is still going to produce something else really exciting um, and they have years to keep producing work um, and there's always going to be something that you do fall in love with. So I, I feel less like it's a missed opportunity and more like it's an opportunity to find something else. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah, that's yeah, a great I answer. I love that. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could have any piece of art in your home and it doesn't need to be emerging Australian artist, like literally the Mona Lisa if you like, what would it be and why? Oh, gosh. I feel like that's my response when you ask me a good question every time. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was studying performance art, um, I studied one of my favourite artists, Eve Klein. And he used humans as paintbrushes. And so for me, it was uh, this performance art meets modern art kind of extravaganza. Um, and he had this beautiful Eve Klein blue that he would use. It was so stunning, like electric blue. Um, and he'd dip the models uh, in or paint, paint the models in this blue and then the models would drag each other or he would drag a model um, across the canvas and make these really beautiful blue swathes. Um, and they have always been, for me, so stunning. They're like people dancing, there's movement in the work. There's also something quite radical because in the 1960s, um, you know, the, the societal norms of um, both genders and how we approached art and what art was, like that was all really shifting um, and the modern art movement was really born and I think he played a huge role in that. Uh, but also the female form and how it was used uh, tells a very interesting story too. I'd love one of his works in my home, I think. There's something very special about that. 
Otherwise, I love the idea of like yeah, a full projected hologram that, that moves around my place. Um, I mean, in the future, we'll probably all have like AR art. We'll put on our AR goggles yeah. and we'll be able to see, um, you know, something that like maybe an AI creates every day a different piece for you and you have to hunt it throughout your house. Like I think there's there's a lot in the future of art as well that I would like to have that I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's so optimistic. I love that. Yeah. It's so funny. I've seen, uh, yeah, I saw a Yves Klein big piece in France and I, I didn't know that's how he painted them. <laughs> I just yeah. was like, oh, it's a nice big blue thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I was painted Probably with bodies. A, a dragged body. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, the texture makes <laughs> more body, sense a now. Live yeah. Body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's some context I missed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so y- you've talked about the, um, your art syndicate for this year, which yes. sounds super exciting. Yeah. Um, what else are you excited about for, for your, your sort of art collecting this year? Is there anything else that, you know, you've got planned or that you're looking forward to or what else is happening in 2024 for you? Well, I'm really excited for the next portrait as well. <laughs> cool. Okay. So yeah, there's a new one. Have you chosen and the artist? I have. Um, so I think I've mentioned Tom Polo. He is one of my absolute favourite artists. Tom is a beautiful human being. The way that he describes um, his artwork and describes people and how people are um, is just beautiful. It's engaging. Um, It's really sensitive. Um, He's a very, very sensitive person. Um, And I really appreciate his, um, how his brain works and his insights and his sensitivity uh, and just his empathy which is really depicted through his work, but also in the way that he speaks. Um, And I have sat down with him already to to work through the start of that work, uh, which is amazing. So we had our first sitting. um, And I would love to tell you more about it, but I'll have to wait until it comes out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And maybe maybe we can talk about it then. Um, But his process uh, was so open to me on how he worked and how he was inspired and how he took uh, the the concept of, um, you know, portraiture um, and extracted that but used his very abstract style and and interwove those two together um, is really interesting. Uh, And maybe, uh, yeah, maybe maybe I'll I'll message you once it comes out and I'll I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about that I can't mention yet. Yeah, sure, yeah. (laughs) Um, But there's, yeah, there's something I'm very excited about in in that work Um, and that's quite a large-scale piece as Mm, well. I was going to ask, is it, yeah, a big one? Okay. Yeah, I'm having to move uh, a wardrobe for it. (laughs) Worth it's worth it. it. It's worth, worth it. it. Worth yeah, it. Exactly. totally. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I was going to uh, – one of my final questions I have is any artists on your radar for collecting this year or coming up that you – yeah, that you've got your eye on? Oh, there's a, um, a young artist that I really love called Mia Bo. She's a an Indigenous artist. Um, I feel like she was based originally – you know what, I'm not going to say that because I'm actually not 100% sure. <laughs> <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Safe. Um, so, so Mia Bo mm-hmm. is uh, the artist I'm most excited about at the moment. She has a very, very um, a strong uh, visual uh, voice. Um, you immediately know that it's her work and she's an incredible storyteller as well. Uh, she tells these uh, colonial Australian stories through her work um, typically of in uh, Indigenous characters and, and how they were treated um, and how the, uh, how the feelings that, you know, you'd imagine those, uh, those personas, um, you know, experienced uh, are depicted in her work, I think is also really uh, interesting. Um, it's quite two-dimensional uh, in, in many respects, her work, like very uh, geometric um, and you don't necessarily, for example, see, like, layers of shadowing. It's like uh, shadows become kind of shapes. Um, and so I think uh, emotion is uh, very stylized uh, in, in her works. And I think personality is really brought out through that um, for, for the characters that she's painting. And I think it's really exciting. Like, it's a brand new style I've never seen before. So she's probably the one I'm most excited about. Yeah. Amazing. Can't wait to see her work. We'll, um, we'll find it and put it up. Please do. Ah, cool. (laughs) Awesome. Well, Nikita, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much for coming in. That was super interesting. I loved hearing about your collecting journey. Yeah, Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Um, And look forward to seeing many more artists on Blue Thumb. Yay! (laughs) 